Netflix's The Crown has become one of the most popular television dramas over the past few years. Its success has reached beyond the borders of its London setting, winning the hearts of an international audience. Not since Game of Thrones has the show become such an international hit. It has brilliant acting, captivating writing, and gorgeous set and costume design. But does it have historical accuracy? The short answer is no, particularly in regards to Season 4. For the sake of brevity, let's just look at the story of Michael Fagan. In the show, Fagan is introduced as a painter who is struggling to find work and was just abandoned by his wife and kids. Frustrated with the poor social support from the government, he meets with Richard Hastings, his member of parliament. Fagan expresses his complaints about Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, his disappointment with the social systems he has to work with, and that the money spent on the Falkland War would be better spent domestically. I'm a painter decorator, but there's not a lot of work around recently. Perhaps because instead of investing in new homes which I could then paint and decorate, Devil Woman here is spending it all on a completely unnecessary war. The conversation is ultimately unproductive, and at the end, MP Hastings sarcastically recommends that Fagan seek an audience with the Queen to express his political frustrations. The Queen? She has a private audience with the Prime Minister every Tuesday. Why don't you drop in at Buckingham Palace to ask her? With this idea planted in his head, Fagan breaks into Buckingham Palace. Due to dumb luck and faulty security, he is able to spend quite a bit of time in the palace. He doesn't leave until being spotted by a maid. After more frustrations with the social system, and after seeing Margaret Thatcher being celebrated as a hero for the victory in the Falklands War, he decides to break into the Queen's Palace again. And again due to dumb luck and security incompetence, his intrusion goes unnoticed. This time, he does get an audience with the Queen. After both calm down at the sight of each other, Fagin begins to express his disdain for Thatcher. He highlights that Thatcher has made life difficult for a tradesman like himself, and that the government's social support systems have been defunded to the point of being completely ineffective. Save us all from her. Who? Thatcher. She's destroying the country. He even goes as far as to say that the Queen herself should be wary of Thatcher as this Prime Minister is the type of person that would overtake the duties of Head of State. You may think you're off the hook, but she's got her eye on your job too. Let me tell you, you'll be out of work soon. Let me assure you, Mrs. Thatcher is an all too committed monarchist. Yeah, but she has an appetite for power, which is presidential. And in this country, a president and a Head of State cannot coexist. Mark my words, she's put us out of work, she's quietly putting you out of work. The Queen is quite responsive and empathetic to Fagin's complaints, and they even shake hands as the police arrive to remove him. Later in the episode, the Queen advocates for Fagin's concerns in one of her meetings with Thatcher. I don't think he's entirely to blame for his troubles. Being a victim of unemployment, which is now more than twice what it was when you came into office just three years ago. If unemployment is temporarily high, man then it is a necessary side effect of the medicine we are administering to the British economy. Shouldn't we be careful that this medicine, like some dreadful chemotherapy, doesn't kill the very patient it is intended to heal? If people like Mr. Fagan are struggling, do we not have a collective duty to help them? This makes for an inspiring story that an ordinary person who is down on their luck can reach the ears of the most powerful people in their nation. The only problem is, most of the story isn't true. Richard Hastings, the MP that Fagan meets with in the show, is entirely fictional. Fagan's real-life MP was John Grant who never spoke with Fagan, making this entire scene a work of fiction. The real-life Fagan had serious problems with mental health, alcoholism, and heroin use. The show is correct in that Fagin's wife and kids had just left him before the break-ins. But this abandonment did not inspire political engagement for the real-life Fagin. Instead, it caused a severe mental breakdown on a man who already needed psychiatric help. The show does address Fagin's mental health, but falsely brushes it off as a misdiagnosis. They say I have mental health problems now. I don't. I'm just poor. 
The real life Fagin gives inconsistent reasons as to why he broke in. About a year after the break in, Fagin recounts that at times he was delirious and even unsure if he was even actually in the Queen's bedroom. I don't know if I went into the Queen's bedroom. I don't really know. You know, um, I went into a room, you know, I remember seeing a lady. I can't really say who even the Queen. Ten years later, in an interview with BBC Radio, Fagan speaks with certainty that he was in the Queen's bedroom, and even provides his motive was that he blamed the Queen for his problems, not Thatcher. The Queen, to me, represented all that was just keeping me down and lack of voice. He also expresses in the interview that during the first break-in, at times he was confused as if he was actually in Buckingham Palace or not. And then all of a sudden I thought, my God, where am I? I'm in Buckingham Palace. I'm, uh, what am I doing here? I mean, it was just like, it was as if your brain had arrived in a TARDIS. It was, you know, how, how do I get out? As for the conversation he had with the Queen, Megan dismissed that anything was said other than the Queen telling him to get out before she fled the bedroom. Walk past it, but it looks too small to be the Queen, so go, go over and I draw the curtain back just to make sure. And suddenly she sat up. What are you doing here? So I said, well, I was dumbstruck, to be honest. And I just, I was thinking what to say. Get out, get out. And she jumped out of bed. What are you doing here? And walked out of the room. I stood there. Maybe I sat on the corner of the bed, all this about long conversations. I mean, a lot has been said about what went on in that room. This is the truth, you know. Nothing but she just said, get out. And that was it. The footman came in. He said to me, you look like you need a drink, mate. If you come over here, I'll pour you, pour you a drink. Later in 2011, Megan gives yet another motive stating he had deep empathy for the Queen and just wanted to chat with her. I was walking past the palace. I just felt some sort of empathy with, with the Queen. And I decided that I'd like to have a chat about her. I walked straight into the Queen's bedroom. I didn't know it was the Queen's bedroom, 700 rooms, but she was there. There's a little person in the bed. It looks too small to be the Queen. I look around, the Queen sits up. And I looked into her eyes. They looked dark. It took, me, it took me a long time to absorb those eyes. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but she's a very strong lady. And I'm left there, and the footman comes and says, you look like you need a drink, mate, and pours me a famous grass whiskey. And then the policeman came in. Well, Fagan's story has changed over the years, a few things remain consistent. It is obvious that he was not in a lucid state of mind during the break-in. In some retellings, Fagin claims that he had several servings of whiskey before breaking in. More importantly, in none of these interviews does he even mention Margaret Thatcher, the Falklands War, or any type of opinion on economic policy. After this episode of The Crown aired, Fagin calls the depiction of the events in the show a work of fiction in two separate interviews. He was never contacted by anyone at the show to get his side of the story. It is clear that the creators of The Crown manipulated the story of Fagin's break-in and falsely turned him into an anti-Thatcher folk hero, when in reality, he was a mentally ill addict suffering a mental collapse from the abandonment of his wife and children. The creators could have made a powerful narrative about the struggles of mental health and addiction. Instead, they fabricated a fictional story for no apparent reason other than to attack Margaret Thatcher. I'm not trying to sound pro-Thatcher nor anti-Thatcher. My point is, if you're going to criticize or praise a political figure and their policies, then it should be done so within the boundaries of fact. In prior seasons of The Crown, showrunner Peter Morgan was more honest how some aspects of The Crown were fictionalized. When the facts you know, whose facts, which historian, what point of view have those historians, so where am I getting my facts? And, you know, I mean, the good news about the royal family and about prime ministers is that both of them are, their day-to-day -day 
movements are so clearly, you know, everybody knows where they were and when on each particular day. You, there's no mystery about it at all. So you can tell the character was here and then here and then here and here. But I have to join the dots. And that's where the act of imagination comes in. And then you're sort of saying, well, hang on a minute. The minute it is, the minute it is committed to film, people are going to assume, if you've done your job right in all the other areas, yeah. if what you're doing is satire and the rules are clear that it's satire, you know, it's one thing. But if what you're saying is this is a plausible emotional reality between plausible human beings, it then follows that what they do and say, people will think you have treated responsibly enough. But of course, there is an act of the imagination. And I think that there's a covenant of trust with an audience where they think I'm watching something and I'm, I sure. think people know. Mm -hmm. But too often I get shocked where people say, oh, but when that happened, I go, well, no, actually, I, I had to imagine that. And mm -hmm. therefore I can't say with any degree of certainty that that is what happened. But I, I wouldn't have done it unless I think there's pretty good reason for it. However, Morgan has abandoned the responsibility of presenting these caveats and has since adopted a bizarre understanding of truth and accuracy. I'm not entirely persuaded that accuracy is a virtue in itself. This is an interpretive medium and a creative medium. If I felt that at the expense of an inaccuracy, I was somehow violating a, an underlying truth, then I couldn't live with that. So you get into this accuracy versus truth thing. I have no idea what Morgan is saying, even after referencing the Oxford Dictionary to make sure that this is not a case of British English being different than North American English. This wasn't said by accident either, as Morgan was quoted as saying something very similar to the times. There is nothing inherently wrong with historical fiction. Some of the best retellings of history are fictional. It becomes a problem when a fictional work is presented as being accurate or is something that is truthful since apparently those are two different things according to Morgan. In the case of the Fagin episode, the pre-credits intro is a series of news clips, and the episode is concluded with an epilogue accompanied with photos of the real-life Fagin. This strongly implies to the audience that everything in between the intro and epilogue are a matter of fact. Sadly, Fagin's break-in isn't the only inaccuracy of season 4, but breaking down each major falsehood would make for a really long video. If you want a more factual retelling of the modern royal history, then I would recommend the following books. All are linked in the description. That's all for this video. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe by clicking here. A big thank you to our patrons, including our VIP patrons Marnie and brand new VIP member Steven. Episode 2 of the Jewish Settlers in the Dominican Republic should be completed by next Friday. Until then, I hope you are having a wonderful holiday season.